Good morning and aloha. aloha. Welcome everyone to Brian Louie United Church of Christ. Um, we are happy you have joined us for worship, whether you are here in person or joining us online. Um, let's turn to your neighbor and greet them with a warm welcome. Hello. And for those of you that are online, you can give us a wave or a shaka. My name is Kristen Andres, and I join our guest speaker, um, Uncle Lenny Andres, and our worship team leading today's service. We would like to thank Raina Calaro for the beautiful altar flowers, and also um, Auntie Audrey Ricola for the flowers that I hear on the piano. Um, now let, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the gathering music by Edwin Ramon. Yeah. 
Thank you, worship team, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, my name is Larry. I'm, I'm looking for children. <laughs> if you're smiling, you're, you're one of the children. Okay, big children. Uh, it says children's story, and I was uh, preaching on the first Sunday, and there was no children's story, so I saw the book that children's story. And I said, I babysit my grandchildren from Monday through Friday, and I get to read this story called, um, it's the book of, I guess, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. And I said, nah, I'm gonna tell that story. Um, <clears throat> for those who uh, yeah, no children. Okay, um, I'm gonna share a story that comes from the Bible in your first book. And um, it's Genesis 3. And I'm addressing today what is truth. Uh, for those of you who are philosophers or who are doing science experiments, who work in the medical and science field or any scientific field, I'll talk to you later. Okay? So this story comes from Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, if you remember, God was setting up in chapter 2, the creation of the world. So in how many days did he finish? Six. Six days. And he rested on the? Seven. So today is the seventh day. You're in church. So you're resting. Okay. So the story is, what is true? You guys come in. It's like, echo my in my heart. Okay. So basically, to read this and we're gonna together dig for truth. I'm gonna ask you some questions. So this will be kind of like a critical thinking exercise, but it relates to how you grew up with this Bible story. So it goes, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Let me pause. I had to backtrack and say, I guarded a lot. And I was going, what kind of tree would that be? And I said, if I want to vocalize it, it would be my favorite tree. It would be not as a Philippine, but Kalamansi tree or the Manuntai tree. But I said, it's the Hayden mango tree. Because yeah. I like Hayden mango, half ripe, and you, you dip it in, uh, show you with sugar. Or if you're real Filipino, use the Rilinga and you use pepper. So, the key thing is, he shouldn't let you from that tree. Remember in chapter 2, he planted the tree in the middle of it, in a garden, and he said to Adam, take care of it. Then he created Eve at the end part, and then the serpent appeared, and the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. That's what the serpent said. But from the fruit of the garden, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, her eyes will be, what? Open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate. And she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sold fig leaves together and made themselves going coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the woman and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of me in the garden. And I, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? The wind said, No. So I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to, to me. She gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, 
what is it this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So, what is the truth? Okay, those of you who are sitting in the science, the medical, and who are basically critical thinkers, your quest for knowledge, what is truth? What is truth? How do you prove truth? Okay, in this story, you want to just do a quick exercise with me. How many of you believe that Adam and Eve believe the truth from, from the serpent or Satan? How many of you believe that? In just, if you take it literally, fine. If you take it metamorphically, it's fine. I'm all kind in this way, but if you look at scripture for the sake of scripture, how many of you believe that they, they believe Satan? There's no right or wrong. Okay. okay. And there was a consequence to eat the fruit. But there's more to it than that. What if I say, what did you really hear? What did the Bible really say as it alludes to truth? Did the serpent really say that? Did he really bring it up? Or did they already know that if they were to partake of the tree, they would have that knowledge and be better than God? What do you think? So, I'm asking all these questions like any normal person, as a lay person also. As an educator and a retired educator, I ask my students, why? And they look at you like, why should I tell you? I teach a study skills class. Why should I take these kind of notes in the Cornell style or write this way in the, this certain style, in the APA style, or this style? And I said, because I never do that in graduate school, but you got to do it because that's the way they want it in the university. They accept it as true. When you get stopped by someone when you're speeding down the winding road, does anybody get speeding tickets for the winding road? I get from the Lenani, Rabbi K. Pop, I go on speeding ticket. But I told the truth. I was speeding. I was going 40, this is 25. And then the guy who came out of the car, was, a, was my student, he said, oh, I'll go. You know, you're so fast. Okay? But the point is, how many of you today would agree that truth is multifaceted? The way you look at it, the way you interpret it, is your truth. What is relative to you is relative. Might be relative to someone else. It might not be. So looking at the scripture, it's a biblical, spiritual truth. For those who believe that the word of God and his promises are true, then it validates your so-called Christian walk. It is the truth. So help me God. That's not the truth. It's okay. And I forgot to ask you to raise your hands for this last one. How many of you believe that as a result of avoiding the truth which Adam and Eve did, they didn't answer the question, they had consequences. And that consequences is spelled in three letters. Spell it with me. S, I, and sin. So all your children can be excused. And then if you go for pop up today, that's a servant and a message. Thank you very much. Now in this time of worship, we are going into what we call pastoral prayer. And um, are there any requests this morning as we uh, gather together as a congregation? And uh, thank you also. And this is this is a pastoral prayer. I am so happy for all of you because you God gave you guys a pastor. I have a connection, I, I don't have a connection with this pastor, I have a connection to his denomination. I, I'm Larry Andres, son, and, son of Florencio and Monica Andres, and then my niece, Kristen Andres and Dale Andres, is, we're all Andreses growing up in the Wailua Church. So my connection was Wailua United Church, or Wailua United Church of Christ, and then through the years I 
they'll accept it as an associate pastor and proceeding them. I left the church work to go into education. And then I finally went back into church uh, called the Evangelical Covenant Church. That's where your pastor, E.J. Rabago, comes from. So E.J. comes to Waikalua. I go to Evangelical Covenant in, uh, we worship at Halava. So Pastor Rebecca, my pastor at Evangelical Covenant said, hey, Harry, you gotta go encourage uh, uh, E.J. And he said, how old is this dude? And he said, he's 41. I'm so, he's young. I said, I'm 67, what can I tell him? And he said, where are you from? Well, he's from Chicago. And then I asked the question, but I am so happy for you that you're gonna grow in the word of God. You're gonna love a journey with the pastor and his young family. And God has shown favor. That's one of the pastoral prayers that God has honored. So praise be to God for that specific prayer request. Um, other requests from the congregation, I have one that is a dear friend of Birch. Uh, can I say his name? Oh, a dear friend of Birch, prayer for healing. Uh, anyone else from the right side wants to pray? I, I was watching the news and I, I want to really pray for Israel and the whole peace stuff that is no, I, I wouldn't really bring it up. I did bring it up. It might cause some ruckus in the church, but I'm going to pray for world peace in a sense that God is in control. I'm not in control. God is. Anybody want to pray for something local? Okay, just want to pray. Oh, okay, okay. The right heels. No, what's that? Oh, the Beatles killing the. Yeah. And the, the Lehua, too. There's another bug that's killing the Ohia Lehua. As a plant lover, the rhinoceros Beatles, yeah. Thank you. Even though God created them, yeah, we still got to pray that they have a different appetite. <laughs> okay, why don't we bow our heads and join in uh, what we call our corporate uh, community prayer of faith? Let's pray. Lord, uh, <clears throat> we're here, we sang some songs that focus on who you are, which is a spiritual truth. And one of the truths is that you said, pray without ceasing. Some of us walk in this morning, and myself, at times I'm not happy with what condition the world is in. And I'm saying that, God, when, when will there be world peace? But we look to you as the God of peace. Your truths are stated in the Old Testament, all the way to the New Testament, saying that you began this world in Genesis, and in Revelation, the time will come, you will gather all your people, and all of this, the rumors of wars, people against each other, government corruption. But we pray for our leaders that they will be aligned to your heart. We pray for the leaders internationally, in Israel, in Iran, Syria, in every country that is prophesied in the Bible, that their hearts will break down and bow not to Allah, but bow down to you, O oh God. We will one and only Jehovah God, who is true and the living God. We pray for those rhinoceros beetles, Lord, that I'm not kidding, that they have a different appetite. They're ruining some of the trees and the fauna here in Hawaii, as well as other invasive bugs that have come in, Lord. I know you created them, but give them a different appetite to stop eating and give the beauty of the land. And we pray, Father, too, that those who are struggling financially, you provide for them in a way a new job, a way in which they can see themselves for an interview, Someone can give them an opportunity to take their skills and they can worthy of earning a living. We pray for those who are going through mental illness. It's so real, Lord, that when we are not looking at things with focus, we can focus on you, your son Jesus, who will comfort us in the time of when we're feeling we're out of our minds and give us this peace that surpasses all human understanding. Do we pray for Father for those who are physically going through receiving news that they have cancer? 
or a friend of cancer and healing for those of friends who say that they need the healing work, not only because you're the great physician, but you touch hearts, you touch minds, and you touch bodies. And Lord, we pray for ourselves that as one of the United Church of Christ, we will welcome this new family that comes from Chicago as we begin not to only look to him as a, a shepherd, but pray for him as a fellow journeyer, sojourner in Christ, that he will show the way how to get to heaven as we prepare for him. Lord, we pray for this day, this day that we celebrate you. Not anybody but you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And all of God's people sin. Amen. The scripture lesson comes from the New Testament, John chapter 14, verses 5 to 7. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of God. You know, I have to thank God because I had a class reunion meeting last week Saturday. Rosemary, I lost my voice. So today I have my voice. Thank you, David, that you have a mic, got me microphones. So if you cannot hear, just raise your hand. Um, as I, I always try to speak louder. <clears throat> but today I welcome you, everybody. Um, this is the second in the series. We had a break because your reverend, I mean your reverend, your pastor came, and we'll, the first one I'd like to remind you was I spoke in the book of John. The Apostle John was really beloved by Jesus. So chapter 14, and then this is just the introduction, and then I went to verses 1 through 6, or uh, 1 to 14, I think. And then now I'm going to start with John 14. You can turn to your Bibles, I think it's in on page 657. It's in the New Testament, John 14, 5 to 7, but you have it in your bulletin this morning. And uh, the reading goes something like this, but before we read it, I want to remind you and refresh our, my memory that this is what happened. In the previous chapter, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he said to them that he was going to prepare a place for, for them. And then he was going to leave them. And then he was going to come back later for them. And then the questions came up from the disciples. They were like, they were having this dinner and they're kind of like, say, what's going on? So Thomas replies in chapter 14, verse 5, if you look at it. And I'm reading from the New uh, International Version. And Thomas, one of the disciples, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I will break this down a little bit later in the message, but this is the word of God. And before I start, <clears throat> um, can we ask, God to guide us today with his word, not Larry's words, his word to, this is the way I want to I share it as a guest speaker. You and I know that there is a, one spiritual truth, there is a end journey for us, and that end journey is heaven. So if I look around, and those of you who believe in that spiritual truth, we're preparing our way with each other, encouraging each other, as sojourners, that life here on earth is temporary, that we prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls 
for heaven. Would you agree with that? So let's pray and ask God to continue to teach us the truth through His Word. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God. Take your scripture, flush it out, help us to understand with your help of your Holy Spirit what is our truth, what is your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I invite for you to take out your little um, sheet and you can follow along with the notes you have with this in your sheet. So, in 1980, I was sent off from this church and to go to Fuller Theological Seminary. I heard in my first two weeks of class, I heard in my theology class, one theory proposed that, get ready, Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. Simply, it was the disciples, they were drunk, and they spread a rumor that he was alive. Then I heard in the discussion among fellow classmates, I heard that Jesus and Buddha are the same pathway leading to God. And then I heard more in the discussions in my later times at school and in the years, I heard that doing good works is the only way to get to heaven. Have you heard similar things? Are these statements the truth? And let me exemplify that the truth is not easy to get to. Because we're inundated with social media, via the internet, TV, podcasts, can I add Instagram, and etc. When Jesus said that he is the way to this gate, he said it in a very incredulous way. He said that gate is small and that gate is narrow, the road. He's merely describing the way to him. It's narrow and it's small. You can answer why later on. So the first slide that I'll ask Chad to put up is take a look at this slide. Thank God for my best friend Google. I was looking for the word truth. Okay, focus on the bottom part, T-R-U-T-H. Truth, and then I saw trust. The point of words is, do you trust the truth? Basically, that came to my mind. So, when your first point says, I am the way, put down the truth to God. That is in John chapter 14, verse five, the second part. I am the truth. I am the way, the truth to God. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about God's truth in human life because all of us can relate to that. God is an unseen spirit. His expression of grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John says also in chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, in the original language, it's basically logos means spoken expression. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, full of grace and truth. In other words, the life and words of Jesus Christ are visible expressions of our Heavenly Father's grace. Grace basically meaning unmerited favor and the truth, which is revealed essence. Let me point out that the word truth will take up various meanings in the Bible. So, I'm going to ask you to participate with a show of hands. After I finish reading this, all you have to answer is all these four statements for you. Know, yeah, four statements, true. Okay, number one. Truth is the opposite of lies or what is false. Okay, truth is the opposite of lies or what is false. Truth is fidelity to God's standard. Number two, truth is fidelity to God's standard. Number three, 
The teaching of Jesus is called the truth. The teaching of Jesus is called the truth. And number four, Jesus called himself the truth. Okay? Simple raising of your right hand or left hand. If you have any extras. How many of you believe that all four statements are true? How many of you believe it's false? No shame. All statements are true. Truth is opposite of lies, but it's false comes from, if you want to write it down, Ephesians 4.14. Truth is fidelity to God's standard, Jeremiah 7, 28. The teaching of Jesus is called the truth, Galatians 2, 5. Jesus called himself the truth, today's message, John 14, 6. Ephesians 4, 14, Jeremiah 7, 28, Galatians 2, 5, John 14, 6. And I want to leave you with this, this thought. The key verse about truth is when the disciples were sent to the Herodians and they were asking him, Teacher, they said, We know that you are a man of integrity and you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention who, to who they are. So Jesus isn't swayed by others and he pays no attention to who they are. That's found in Matthew twenty-two sixteen. 16. Simply put, my friends, and to myself, Jesus clearly states that he is the only way and the only truth to God. Can we go to slide two? What you have here in front of you, and those of you who have a Bible, I brought this Bible today because it's also given by a Wailua friend. It was given to me when I accepted Jesus Christ in 1978 at the University of Hawaii Manoa by Farley Bayuda, Pastor Farley. Farley gave me this Bible and he told me, Brother, read your Bible. Hey, look old, but you put too much marks in you. I need another Bible. But I got this in record as the Word of God from Farley in 1978, so that makes me 35. <laughs> so, the Word of God, the truth in your in your uh, bullet points, not bullet points, in your um, Philippine likes, the truth is based on the Word of God. Pray my voice will be. And His promises, which are the cornerstone of truth. Okay? So, we got Word of God, we got promises, and cornerstone. I'm going to elaborate on those three a little bit to basically not prove the truth, but let that press lead to the truth. Okay? So, I want to I wanna say that I've been following this um, pastor named David Jeremiah. How many of you heard of him, David Jeremiah? Okay. Uh, I like his teaching. It's very simple and to the point. But I know David Jeremiah. I just steal from him. And I want to read from him. I want to read what he said that really encouraged my heart. He said that sadly many people today put the Bible in the irrelevant category. The word is irrelevant. It's interesting and worth preserving the Bible for historical reasons, but not for practical purposes. It has literary beauty. It has historical records. And even some of its moral teachings are said to be commendable. I want to emphasize, after reading this from David Jeremiah, no one is more eager to promote irrelevancy of the Bible than Satan. If we think of the Bible as the Word of God as it is, we find plenty examples in Scripture of Satan trying to convince the people that God's words are irrelevant to their time and place. Even today, it started in the story that I told you this morning, in the Garden of Eden, in chapter 3. Did Satan really, did he say, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the fruit? Context. Statement. You must not eat. Did God say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It also continued with Satan. He accused Job of unfaithfulness. So, one main point to take away Satan's main purpose is to make God's word irrelevant to those who hear it. So the challenge to you this morning 
as a Christian is to discern what is truth based on scripture versus the lies of this world. What truth or lies are you pursuing or even believing? If we accept God's truth from the word of God, this verse validates it. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but I will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Isaiah 55, 11. Slide two, please. I'm not gonna bounce off this, but as a former theological student and still involved in theology, I've heard so many friends and myself getting caught in it too, is the Bible is not culturally relevant. Historically, it's outdated. And, and you can go on and on. The redaction of the Bible, the historic criticism of the Bible. Those are fancy words that theologians use to just pile on us as, as, as a congregation. And the Bible says you can't add to it or you can't take away from it. So it remains consistent. So if the premise is the, the Bible has remained consistent 2,000 years ago to today, what is the difference? I don't want to debate. I just want to lay it out there. And because I've been going through that, it's a struggle for me. And I didn't want to say, I want to enter into the intellectual realm of this. But when it says my word goes out from my mouth, it will return to me not empty. It will accomplish what it desires and achieve the purpose for which I stand. So I'll stop with that and I can do some discussions later on on the side. But I want to say about the word promises. How many of you all honestly believe God's promises are true? So you don't have to ask me to see your heart. For God keeps them. There's a verse in Hebrews 10, 23. God who is promised is faithful. How does God's faithfulness show by itself? Basically, God's unfailing fulfillment of his promises to each one of us. God will fulfill each promise that's found in scripture. He will never fail those who trust his word. I came to own Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, it says, so those of you who know it, it says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. The living, the living Bible says he'll crown your path with success. Um, when I was attending seminary in the 80s, it was not always rosy and easy. I struggled financially in Pasadena from day to day. And basically on loans to purchase food, uh, text materials, and etc. But as loans would go, my own money ran out. So my roommate and I existed on, you know, when you go, you get lace, the macadamia nut lace stuff, and then friends give you the macadamia nut packs. I ate macadamia nuts at Alpha Beta Market had lemon yogurt, three for 99 cents. <laughs> so my roommate, Doug, and I would go eat macadamia and, um, and, and yogurt. This is my favorite yogurt, uh, lemon yogurt. <laughs> and uh, then a check came in the following week. After two weeks of yogurt, I was like, oh God, what, man, I put sounds better. <laughs> I said, a check came in. And I was like, wow, God is faithful. I saw firsthand how God provided. A fellow believer in the Lord sent me a tiny check for school purposes, but we bought food. God provides. However, his promises of, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake me, that's what came so true to me in Hebrews 13, 5. My favorite verse, I asked my wife, when I go to heaven, I would like that they printed. Oh, I gotta have that printed because I don't need to be it. Hello. So, Hebrews 35 is my favorite verse. And so, I want to challenge you this morning. Is how many of you need to continue to trust God's truth and follow in His Word? How many of you saw Him come through for you in your family, your health, your financial, your church, your work, your personal situation? But I got a feeling, I was sitting in your chair. I'm going to ask this question. So, Larry, how does this work? How does this work? If you say that God's word is true, his promises are true, and you, you share the story I provided for you, 
um, and fulfills his promises? Can I share three ways that you can look at it? Psalms 19, 7 through 11 has a lot in the Bible to say about the relevance of God's truth. It's eternal. It's Psalms 19, 11, 7 through 11 says that God is perfect, is blameless, is trustworthy, is right, is enlightening, is pure, eternal, true, and full of righteousness. So if Psalms 19, 11 says that I believe in the word of God and that's a spiritual truth, that internally I believe that is true. But you know what? As I've been going through and researching, there have been many civilizations and cultures that have characterized human history. You know about the Roman history. You know about the Persians uh, taking over the Babylonians. Their ways might have been have some bright spots, but if you really take a look and how, for the most part, that it can be characterized by the opposite word that the Bible uses, we see words as imperfect, from perfect, not trustworthy, wrong, dark, impure, temporal, full of error, and unrighteousness. Simply put, when the Word of God is infused in these environments, do you believe the Bible offers way of truth to correct human actions? And there was a study that was done that reviewed 15,000 documents that was used by America's founding fathers. And if Mrs. Ishii, my history teacher at White Hill High School, I remember Ben Franklin, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, um, was it John Adams or Jay Adams? John Adams, right? And Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the founding fathers. They, their articles and newspapers, pamphlets, and their, their books and monographs Guess what was quoted the most? The Bible. In all of their writings, which assisted in the building of our nation. So internally, the Bible is worthy because it is trustworthy, it's right, enlightening, and etc. Point number two to back this up is the Bible externally practical? I addressed that earlier in my, my first statements. The word of God is externally practical as you trust your pastor or guest speakers in your church to teach what is true and to make you realize and make me realize what needs to be corrected in our daily lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do is right. Second Timothy 3.16 says that, that the Bible will do that. How many of you love the book of Proverbs? The book of Proverbs is basically a book of wisdom. And in the Hebrew word, wisdom is uh, translated as skill. How to live skillfully from God's point of view. And it's the point of view on this. Proverbs addresses these areas. And I had a Bible study with a group of men on the whole book of Proverbs. And we learned about money. We learned about relationships, emotions, sex, discipline, and more. So, externally it's practical. The Bible has sayings that are practical. Third, the Bible is externally positive. No matter how chaotic and frenzy and crazy our world gets, the Bible has a positive message. It's just four words. God is in control. God is in control. Let us believe this is true. The Word of God will answer two relevant questions that I was searching for in my early years. Question one. Some of you have been asking this, or maybe still asking this. What does the future hold? What does the future hold? God has a plan for the future. The prophecies of the scripture in the past and present has been, or have been, or are being fulfilled. They should give us the confidence that God's future plans will be fulfilled. Get this. God has a big plan to all who believe is true. He will gather all his people together, even to the end of the age, and usher us into the glorious eternal state called heaven. So what does the future hold? The promise of heaven to those who believe in the truth. Question two. I ask this question 
and I was in Religion 150 with Dr. Aoki. What happens when I die? What happens when I die? For those who belong to Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 John 3.16 assures us to believe in Jesus Christ is not to perish but to have eternal life. To believe in Jesus Christ is to receive eternal life now. Let me make the difference of explanation of eternal life. The spiritual truth that I know in the Bible as I looked at the New Testament. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life now. The eternal life that people talk about is the future eternal life that you're going to be with God forever. But as a Christian, you receive Jesus, the eternal life now. You're going to, the promise is you're going to live with him forever on earth as it is in heaven. Eternal life when Christ comes back to make a judgment in the book of Revelations. You have that forever with him. So there's not two, two places of eternal life. It's one time, and the eternal life that he talks about is for the future. So, cornerstone of this whole thing is, it's basically the cornerstone is the basic part of its existence, of its success for what truth depends on. So the cornerstone for most Christians would be the Word of God and the promises, the Bible, and the first one is the primary way to understand the primary truth to God, which is Jesus. How many of you remember that song, the B-I-B-L-E? That's the book for me. I stand on the word and the word is God, the B-I-B-L-E. I think that was taught to us by Mrs. Uh, Matutino and you uh, and Mrs. Vea, other uh, members of the White Wing Church. So I want to stop here and then finish off the third part. Go on to the third slide. And this is, before we go into this, the third part that you want to write is knowing the truth sets you free. So you can testify what Jesus has done to tell others. Uh, John 8.32 says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm going to finish off with this. We're going to end pretty soon. But the most powerful part is your testimony. Each of you should have a testimony or a testimony that is being formed when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Um, growing up in the plantation, I thought I was going to be a sugar cane worker. I watched the turn into hollers. I saw my father come home. So that was the psychological imprint that I had. I was going to be a sugar cane worker. But thank God for the educational system. I look around. A lot of us were educated because of our parents' wrong work for the capacity to give us that foundation to go to school. So I came to that church in Mill Camp, that church that was together formed with a white church was it was it came from Hickam and they, they brought it down the winding road, amazingly or the other way, and they set the church in that and that's where I attended. But guess what? As a young person, I only went to church because why do you United Church of Christ get the best pot? <laughs> and Andy Bracero's part of the Udon and I used to go play by the trees in the back. So I remember that. So what am I alluding to the truth? The truth is, I didn't know Jesus Christ. People were talking about it, but I didn't make a personal decision to accept Jesus Christ. And so when I accepted Christ at the University of Hawaii, I was free. I was looking for a purpose because what I was taught, and I'm not doubting why I do it. Study hard, no make shape, a family name, work hard. Okay? My father taught me that, and those truths are real. We work hard, we don't shape the family name, go to school. And we see the fruits of that success through education, through the journey and making friends of life, whether we live in the mainland or excuse me, the continent, or we live internationally or elsewhere. So how can knowing the truth set you free? When you accept Jesus, this is one of the fallacies that most Christians forget, and the chicken there too. So the part is, 
When you accept Christ, the Spirit of God comes in you and dwells in you. And the Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept it because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you who accept Christ, you know Him, for He lives in you and will be in you. And that's John 14, 17. It says, He will live in you and will be in you. And then if you keep on looking more, you start to see his life. He was blind for so many years. He couldn't go down to the pool of Siloam. He kept going and he did it so that Jesus healed him. And um, after Jesus healed him, guess what happened? He went out into the village and the people said, wasn't this guy uh, a son of so and so? Uh, was he blind because of his sin? Is that one truth that you heard? The other one was, he was saying Jesus healed him. That's the truth that he was explaining. Jesus healed him. Jesus healed him. So, when you came to your conversion, did you share with anyone how Jesus healed you? And in sharing that, it also frees you because it tells others where you've been and now you are a new creation in Christ, spiritually speaking. And this is why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you, make you free. When we know by experience our time of conversion, God's perspective of truth is revealed in us, we experience eternal life now and then. And as our consciousness shifts, we partake of the eternal qualities of God during life here on earth. And I'm going to close with an exercise for you again. There's going to be five powerful truths. And I'm going to I'm going to let you think about this one, true or false. After I read all the true and false, I'm going to ask again. Five powerful truths about Jesus. This is broken down in regular English. Jesus made everything, including you and me. One. Two. Jesus is the only way to know God, our Father. Number three. Jesus is victorious over Satan. Number four. Jesus is higher than any other, and his name is above all other names. Number five, we are called to tell people about Jesus and teach them about him. True or false? All five statements true? How many are false? All five statements are true. I'm an easy teacher. Everything is true. Because it does in the Bible. So, in conclusion, as we all see it in this wide world, United Church of Christ, a beautiful sanctuary, raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Amen. That's me. Lord, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus can claim and say, I am the truth to God. I pray that everyone who heard and myself too, Lord, will, will cling to the truth truth that you promise in your word and promises in your verses. Pray that anybody who is struggling with the truth right now with critical thinking and questioning, which is healthy, but simply coming to you as a child again, to look at your words, to accept your words by faith. Pray for the renewing in our hearts, a renewing in our minds, and a renewing in our souls. So Lord, thank you for being our truth from now till the day you come. Pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Uncle Larry, for this morning's message and for reminding us of the truth. Sometimes it's easy to just um, you know, lean on our own understanding. So, thank you for that reminder. And tell me story. I like your story about the chocolate. When I was in college, I didn't want to ask my parents for money. So there was a week when I was living off of pizza, Hawaiian bread, banana, and Nutella. <laughs> Luckily, my roommates, they, they um, were like, how come are you on like a weird diet or something? <laughs> no, like my paycheck, I'm like stretching it, so. I think we went to Costco that Friday, and let me tell you, that was the best time that I had in my life. 
<laughs> so God will God provides and then He sends people to to, to help and provide for us. So thank you. Um, so let's remember that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Um, may that just give come forth for this morning's offering. <laughs> Faith Claro at um, 360-4. 
Are there any other announcements? Your truth in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Go forth, thou, brother and sister. 